Okay, thank you, Michael. I know you hear me. I was just uh, making sure that the the recorder was going. All right, welcome. Uh, tonight we'll spend a little more time, uh, a little bit of time, looking at some verses surrounding the two-edged sword. Let me minimize the screen. If you bear with me. Sometimes my computer is so slow. I have to I have to check that flash player. It's so annoying sometimes. All right. Let's see if I can get this to come up here. Have you uh, seen Eric at all? I know he was offline for a little bit. It's just uh, I haven't seen him in a while. All right. Let's see. We'll look at the number two first. So let me post the heading. And by the way, there is a. I offered some verses on the Berean study site. Let's see if Pal Talk is going to cooperate tonight. The number two, or the double, I think is looking at the judgment on Babylon. There is a study, I think the name of it is uh, Paying Double. It's on the Berean study site. I'm not going to go over every verse again regarding the number two, but I think it's important, Lord willing, in trying to understand Hebrews 4, verse 12. For the word of God is quick and powerful. Let me post that. Hopefully I can get the colors to stay. Okay, there it is. The word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit, and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Now you know what I think is interesting here, just um, at the start, is the fact that God is doubling the, the wording here. Can you see that? Soul and spirit, joints and marrow, the discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. And whenever we see that, the, there are some other examples uh, done the same way with the number four. Whenever we see that, I think uh, God is emphasizing the, the importance of the number two here as it relates uh, in the context to the judgment on Babylon. And we see in Jeremiah chapter 16, so first of all, the, the word of God is the sword of the spirit. We'll, uh, we'll look at that also in a few minutes. But just looking at how the, the number 2 is used, we read in uh, Jeremiah 16, 18, And first I will recompense their iniquity and their sin double. Have you ever wondered about that? And their sin double. What does that mean? Because they have defiled my land, they have filed mine inheritance, with the carcasses of their detestable and abominable things. We also read in Psalm 12, verse 2, They speak vanity, every one with his neighbor, with flattering lips, and with a double heart do they speak. So again, what does it mean to recompense the sin double and the fact that the church has a double heart? Jeremiah 16, 18. And first I will recompense their iniquity and their sin double. There it is again. Because they have defiled my land. And, oh, wait a minute. I think I, yeah, I have that verse twice. I'm sorry. I posted that verse earlier. I'll have to remove that. Jeremiah 17, verse 18. Let's start with the, uh, hold on one second, uh, bear with me one second. Alright, let them be confounded that persecute me, let them, but let not me be confounded. Let them be dismayed, but let not me be dismayed. Bring upon them the day of evil and destroy them with double destruction. So again, my question is, what does it mean when God speaks of double in the context of bringing judgment on Babylon? 
So it's not a coincidence. I think we do see a pattern. Look at uh, Judges or Jude 1 verse 12. Look at the last part. Twice dead, plucked up by the roots. Twice dead. Double destruction. So how do we understand that? Isaiah 51 verse 19. These two things are come unto thee, who shall be sorry for thee, desolation and destruction. Maybe that's why God is uh, using the number two here in the context of judgment to relate to the death of Babylon. Because it's always desolation, destruction, famine, the sword. You see that? Perhaps that's, uh, that's what's in view. And why the number two, given the proper context, is looking at the judgment on Babylon. So these two things. What about Revelation 21, verse 8, where we read about the second death? But the fearful and unbelieving, the abominable, murderers, whoremongers, sorcerers, and idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Okay, Ms. T.S., hi, welcome. Uh, just getting started, offering some verses, looking uh, at the number two, first of all, in the context of judgment. Twice dead desolation and destruction the second death uh, rewarding let's see like Jeremiah 16 verse 18 I will recompense their iniquity and their sin double so just trying to lay the foundation here just to show or at least offer some verses with the number two so that when we look at the two-edged sword and I know in the past I've been taught, and we, without doing Bible study, and, and this is where I think it's important. You know, by God's grace, we, we have the Bible. We also have teachers many times. Now, they're not always faithful, but here's another reason I think, Lord willing, why it's important that we make sure that we don't simply quote uh, a, a Bible teacher. We don't trust what they tell us. We, we have to look for... Uh, we look at the Bible to make sure that what they're offering is, is accurate. Uh, because this is a verse, let me post the heading here. What I was going to say is that this is a verse, if you look at it on the surface and then connect it with another verse, which I'll, sh I'll share also in a minute, we might get the impression, at least I did, that the the two-edged sword we're looking at one sword that is God's judgment and the other sword or the other side of the sword would be salvation pops hi welcome now correct me if I'm wrong isn't that isn't this the way you've uh, understood maybe Hebrews 4 verse 12 for the word of God is quick and sharper than any two-edged sword piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit, joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Now, looking at some other verses, related verses, like this one, for example, Proverbs 5, verse 4. But her end is bitter as wormwood. Who's God talking about there? Who is her? Who do you suppose is in view? Her end is bitter as wormwood, sharp as a two-edged sword. Now I happen to think that Babylon is in view here, again, in the context. At the end, Christ is the beginning and the end. We've, I've offered some verses uh, surrounding Antichrist coming, looking like Christ in the Day of Judgment. And they too, they are said to be, uh, they are the, well first of all they were first and now they become last. And so the end there could also spiritually be identifying with Antichrist. Oh you haven't. 
Oh, you're now answering me, huh, Michael? I guess you might you might have been away from the computer. Yeah, I haven't heard from him either. So hopefully everything's all right. Uh, her end is bitter as wormwood, sharp as a two-edged sword. Now, there's nothing in this verse that I see that would indicate that this two-edged sword here, that Babylon somehow is preaching a gospel of judgment and a gospel of salvation, right? So therefore, the number two, looking at the two-edged sword, it has to be purely, Lord willing, judgment. It is another name or another reference for Babylon. Does that make sense? And we'll try and develop that further. Ephesians 6, verse 17. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Now it is true that God's Word, it is through the, the hearing of the Gospel. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. So there is an aspect, uh, one side of the Word of God or an aspect of the Word of God that does bring salvation. But the other side the word of God that brings judgment is not coming from the believers. Right? From everything I can see in the Bible, it's not coming from the believers. It is coming from the church, the false prophets, Babylon. That's God's method of judging the unsaved body, allowing them to be subject to themselves. And so the church then commits suicide. Take a look at Jeremiah 5, verse 14. Wherefore, thus saith the Lord God of hosts, because ye speak this word, behold, I will make my words in thy mouth fire. So where is the fire coming from? When God speaks of uh, burning the wicked, judging by fire, where is that fire coming from? Yeah. It's not coming from the elect. You know, there are some today, they want to tell you where the believers are judging the world. It's the word, no, it's not the word of God. The word of God is not, you know, in the mouth of the elect, is not judging the world, but rather, uh, I think God would be using the word to provide revelation, and there is salvation there. But as far as the judgment aspect of it, it is God's word in the mouth of the wicked, the false prophets. They come looking like Christ. They are anti-Christ. They come with the Bible, with the Word of God, but yet rather than a blessing, they are destroyed by it. So I will make my words and thy mouth fire, and this people would, and it shall devour them. My soul is among lions. Psalm 57 verse 4. And I lie even among them that are set on fire. See that again? Even the sons of men whose teeth are spears and arrows, and their tongue a sharp sword. Now the believers, they were subject to this fire. When? Judgment begins at the house of God. When were the believers also taken, not taken in judgment, but God testing them, allowing them to go through the fire. That fire again, I believe it is God allowing Antichrist to rule in tribulation and judgment. Michael writes, God puts the word in the mouth of the wicked. Yes. Yeah, precisely. So the judgment is coming from, it is God who is in charge of it. He, he's orchestrating it. But he uses Babylon. He uses a third party. He uses the false prophets, the locusts. Uh, he allows them to rule, and that's the form of judgment. Miss T.S. writes, 2 Peter 3, 7, But the heavens and the earth, which are now by the same word, are kept in store, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. Yes, amen. And you know what's interesting here again is that uh, if we look at this verse on the surface, We'll think that it is talking about the very last day. It's talking about the destruction of the earth by fire, literal fire. No, no, not primarily. Perhaps God will destroy the world, 
by fire, but I don't think we can use these verses to prove that. If we allow the Bible to uh, interpret the Bible, the fire is the word of God in the mouth of the wicked. And the world is parabolic, or the earth is parabolic language for the church, the body of Christ. So it is the false prophets that are devouring, that are destroying the, the church, the corporate body, Antichrist, the ruling. And that's the fire. I believe that's in view. And it's the same thing in 2 Peter 3, 7. The heavens and the earth, that's parabolic language for the body. Yes, yes, yeah, exactly. It is the destruction of the false prophets. Uh, because Babylon, when the church becomes Babylon, then every man's sword is against his brother. So it's not surprising today to see so many uh, Gospels that are contrary to the Word of God. So, and, and that's worldwide. That's pretty much everywhere you turn. So therefore, the believers cannot be, they could not be judging the world it is the world, the, the unsaved body, the false prophets that God is using to judge uh, the church. Uh, let's see, Revelation 1.16, same thing I believe is in view here. And he had in his right hand seven stars out of his mouth. Now even though God is saying, the context is speaking of Christ, it is speaking of Christ, but it is speaking of Christ in judgment. And the judgment of Christ is the fact that he allows the false prophets to destroy each other. So it's out of his mouth. That's the judgment side of Christ. Can you see that? Christ is judging, but he is not actively judging. He is judging through the locust, through the thieves, right? Out of his mouth went a, went a sharp two-edged sword. Now this sword here, um, again, it's in the context of judgment. And therefore I don't see one part of the sword being salvation and another part of the sword being judgment. Although, like I said before, there is also the gathering of the elect uh, unto Christ. And that, is, that would have to be coming through the unsealing of the Bible. But as far as the number two, as it relates to the, the sword, the two-edged sword, I think that is purely Babylon. Psalm 149, verse 6. Let the high praises of God be in their mouth and a two-edged sword in their hand. Now, can you see why the Bible also tells us that the believers, the saints, shall judge the world? Can you make that kind of a connection? How would the believers then judge the world? Anyone? Uh, I was going to put some other verses here, but that's okay. How are the believers, the saints shall judge the world? How are they judging the world? Well, because they're judging the world with, with whom? By knowing who is who, no. How can you know who is who? How can you determine who? Are you saying uh, by knowing who's elect or who's a believer, Miss T.S.? If false prophets, if the fire is the word of God in the mouth of uh, of the false prophets. So how is it that the believers are said to be judging the world with Christ? Because they too, they are a part of the body of Christ. Christ is the head of the body and the eternal body, the believers, the elect, they that is Christ so you know they're not judging apart from Christ they are judging with Christ because it's one body Can you see that so God uh, I think there's a verse that comes to mind about Christ giving authority uh, ruling with a rod of iron and he said that the elect also would rule with a rod of iron 
So he gives them the authority. He gives them power over scorpions. So they themselves, the believers, are not actively judging. They're not. They're simply, they rule with Christ. And because Christ is using a third party, because he is using Babylon, so the believers, they too, they have a two-edged sword. And that's Babylon. That's like, you know, someone comes to your house and you have a, uh, a rat waller, a dog, a guardian. Well, if someone comes to rob your house, you don't have to go after them yourself. Perhaps you can, you know, you let the dog out. So the dog is, you're in charge of the dog. You can call the dog back. So you set the dog on the thieves who come to rob your house. Can you see the, the um, connection that I'm trying to offer here? So God uses Babylon. Babylon is the servant of God, the false prophets, the locusts, they rule under the authority of Christ. And so too, the believers, they are said to be reigning, they are ruling with Christ. They're not actively judging, but rather they are a part of the body. And since Christ is judging, they too, they are judging. Ezekiel 21, 19, also thou son of man, appoint thee two ways that the sword of the king of Babylon may come. So I think it's interesting how the number two comes up again and again in the context of God's judgment of Bab on Babylon. Uh, oh yeah, these are the verses. Now let me try and po let me post these verses just to establish the setting and the one that I want to look at, which is verse 38. And this is in a context. We're looking at Luke chapter 22. Let's see. Yeah, Luke 22, verse 35. This is verse 36. Then he said unto them, But now he that have a purse, let him take it, and likewise his script, his script, and he that have no sword, let him sell his garment and buy one. And I think uh, what's in view here is, you know, Christ is about to go to the cross, and that was a type uh, of the church coming into the Great Tribulation. So now every man is on his own because Christ is not there. The, the, the head of the body is not there. For I say unto you that this uh, that is written must be accomplished in me. And he was reckoned among the transgressors for the things concerning me half an end. And then in the same context in verse 38 we read the disciples uh, saying here and they said Lord behold here are two swords so my my guess is that perhaps they they're not understanding that Christ had to go to the cross and they are ready to do battle with those who are coming to take him and yet and here they're giving him two swords they're offering two swords and the two swords there spiritually it would have to be relating to Babylon so they're saying, here, go ahead and defend yourself. So, and, and I think we see some of the, uh, you know, some of this in other verses in the Bible. They don't understand that the the judgment uh, Christ had to endure, and therefore they try to, uh, you know, band together and as if they are going to, as if they are going to uh, do battle with Christ. Can you please hold on? Can you? I think it's rude, you know. You come into a room and you start posting. So I'm going to leave the red dot. You, you're welcome to stay if you want. Uh, I'm sharing some verses here in a Bible study. And then we'll open the mic after that for a uh, discussion. Okay, any questions so far? Let me, so yeah, in verse 38, the two swords there uh, seems to be implying again the the nature of the judgment that God brings on the church. All right, Ezekiel 21 verse 9. Son of man, prophesy and say, Thus saith the Lord, say a sword, a sword. Now, you know why God doubles things in the Bible, correct? Remember the dream that Pharaoh had and then Joseph was interpreting the dream and he said that the dream was doubled on the Pharaoh because it was sure to take place. Um, anyone remember what verse that is? Let's see. So 
So that's the principle I think we see there in the Bible. I was trying to see. That's for the dream double. Let me see if I can find the uh, the exact reference. Yeah, Genesis 41, verse 32. And for that the dream was double on the Pharaoh twice, because the thing is established by God, and God will shortly bring it to pass. What thing? Well, ultimately, I think it is God's judgment. Correct? It is God's judgment. So the fact that God is repeating the sword here, uh, I don't think is a, a coincidence or an accident. And notice the word sharpen. Remember that the, the word of God is a two-edged sword or sharper than any two-edged sword. I think we can see the, uh, the, the tie in there. All right, and then uh, Revelation 19, verse 15. Out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword. And again, I propose that the sharp sword here is not coming from the mouth of the elect. Although God uses, remember, I will put my words in thy mouth. And because it is the word of God unto judgment, God speaks of it as if it's coming out of his mouth. And in a sense it is because it's coming from the church. The church identified corporately with the body of Christ. Does that make sense? So out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword that with it he should smite the nations and he shall rule them with a rod of iron and he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of almighty God. Now here's a, another verse. I'm not sure if this relates directly. God also looks at Babylon uh, with the number two in mind or in view. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. Okay, any questions? Any questions there? So, so far I've offered some verses uh, looking at the number double, uh, the number two, the double, the twice, twice dead, plucked up by the roots. And then offering some verses uh, looking at the sharp sword. And I'm offering there again that the number two, the two-edged sword, is a picture of the judgment that comes on the church through the false prophets. Now, the next verse I want to look at, let me post the title, the heading here, A Savor of Life and Death. Is that talking about the two-edged sword or gospel of salvation? or judgment. Now, Family Radio in the past, uh, Mr. Camping, without even really showing uh, other verses that would confirm this, and you and I, and, and you, this is just how, how gullible perhaps we are when it comes to spiritual things, you know, you look at this verse, let me post it, and then you make a connection. You make a tie in there, Looking at 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 15 and 16. For we are unto God a sweet savor of Christ, and them that are saved, and, and them that perish. To the one we are the savor of death unto death, and to the other the savor of life unto life. Okay, so now what we what i believe is in view here first of all i'm not seeing a direct link a, a connection here between this verse and the two-edged sword on the surface there appears to be one but i mentioned before you know the number one uh, i am yet to find i could be wrong on this it seems to be pointing to christ number one uh, salvation uh, there may be other verses where the number one is uh, focusing on judgment. And if anyone knows of such verses, uh, you know, please don't hesitate to share. What I'm saying here is that I, I'm not able to tie 2 Corinthians 2 verses 15 and 16 to Hebrews 4 verse 12. So what Mr. Camping offered or Family Radio is that the two-edged sword, one side is a savor of life that is Christ salvation and the other side of the sword is 
the condemnation of God on the unsaved. Now that appears to be logical. That, that seems to make sense. So let's look at some verses that use the same word, uh, the savor. And it's really looking at the smell, uh, the savor of life, and the savor of death. And Ephesians 5 verse 2, And walk in love as Christ also have loved us, and have given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet, what is that? A sweet smell. I think I may have, uh, oh, I'm sorry, a sweet smelling savor. Yeah. Sweet smelling savor. Here's another verse, Philippians 4 verse 18. But I have, Al, and abound, I am full, having received of Epaphroditus the things which were sent from you, an order of sweet smell. It's the same word, a sweet savor. It's a sweet smell, a sacrifice acceptable, well pleasing to God. Let me just uh, share a couple of more verses and then we'll, we'll try and uh, discuss them. And John chapter 12, verse 3. Let me just look at the, the latter part of the verse. And anointed the feet of Jesus, wiped his feet with her hair, and the house was filled with the odor of the ointment. Now this is actually a, another a Greek word that is used here for sweet smell or savor. But I think the context is, is looking at the same thing. And in verse 14, 2 Corinthians chapter 2. Now thanks be unto God, which always causeth, causeth us to triumph in Christ, and maketh manifest the savor of his knowledge by us in every place. And then uh, two more verses, Ephesians 5 and verse 2. Walk in love, as Christ also have loved us, and have given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling savor. A sweet-smelling savor. And then Philippians uh, 4, verse 18. Now here's another verse that I think I, I doubled up on. Sorry about that. I, I already posted this verse. So I'll have to remove it. Okay, so to summarize, what I'm offering is that I am not seeing a direct connection. Now, again, I could be wrong. Uh, I try to look at some of these verses and try to relate them. I'm not seeing a direct tie in there between 2 Corinthians 2, verse 15 and 16, and Hebrews 4, verse 12. So the two-edged sword that we read about in Hebrews 4 and elsewhere in the Bible seems to be looking primarily at God's judgment on Babylon. Now in 2 Corinthians 2 and verse 15 and 16, for we are unto God a sweet savor of Christ and them that are saved. Well, yeah, Christ comes, the gospel is about judgment and salvation, correct? The gospel is about judgment and salvation. And so of course, when the word goes out, when you know, throughout the New Testament church age, and even prior to that, it's all about the name of Christ. The wages of sin is death. So it's all about the name of Christ. In the name of Christ, there is judgment and there is salvation. But that does not imply necessarily that this is also relating to the two-edged sword. It doesn't mean that the the two-edged sword is in view. When it comes to the uh, the two-edged sword, I think it is primarily looking at God's wrath, God's judgment through the locusts, through the thieves, the false prophets, the men of renown, Nimrod. So with that said, let me post the, the summary and then we can open for a discussion or offer of correction very oops hold on one second 
So what I'm offering here again, the Bible appears to be associating, and the reason that I summarize my uh, the studies that I offer is rather than just looking at a, a bunch of verses, not really understanding what how I'm looking at them. This will sort of like give you an idea as to, again, you know, the, the purpose of the study and the conclusion that I'm able to come to until, uh, you know, we would find other information in the Bible that would lead us in another direction. All right, so the Bible appears to be associating the two-edged sword to the Word of God, and that's Babylon, believe it or not. In judgment, the Word of God is Babylon. Why? Because it is the mouth, it is the word of God and the mouth of the wicked. The number two would seem to relate to both judgment and salvation. In judgment, however, Babylon is the object of wrath, and therefore this number is highlighted to reveal her judgment. Okay, any questions? Let me turn off the recorder and we'll open for discussion.